Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had a lovely lunch. I'm um, sorry for the delay in getting started there. So good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for our session on new explorers and new technologies. This session is dedicated to exploring the intersection of new technologies, emerging explorers, and the power of crowdsourced bathymetry in reshaping the landscape of ocean mapping. So joining us today to share their experience and knowledge, firstly, we'll have Colin Thompson of Orange Force Marine, then we'll have Anthony Clem of NOAA, Shaw Solomon of DocTech, and last but not least, we'll finish up with Brian Calder from the Centre of Coastal Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. So first up, we're going to have Mr. Colin Thompson from Orange Force Marine. So Colin has over 30 years of experience across a range of diverse industries. A retired naval officer from the Royal Canadian Navy, Colin founded Beachcomber Management and Marine Services to provide consultant services related to IT, training and general marine services. Currently, Colin is the project director for Orange Force Marine and responsible for the development and deployment of the crowdsourced bathymetric solution. He's also involved in IHO CSB activities and he's actively engaged in search and rescue activities on Lake Ontario. So here we have Colin Thompson. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone enjoyed lunch. Um, I'm going to start off the sessions today, um, and I'm going to be talking about collaboration. Uh, we developed a solution for Gloss that Tim mentioned earlier, um, but we didn't do it alone. So we're going to talk a little bit about who we did it with, what the solution is, um, what the results we've had, and where we're going from, uh, how we're going to go forward. So a little bit about Orange Force Marine. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Canada, we're from Southwestern Ontario, a small boutique um, survey company specializing in survey operations, but also technology solutions. Um, the, co the president, co-founder, um, Derek Niles, uh, and myself teamed up to, to create this solution. We come from a common background. Uh, Derek is more in the survey world, but also with the Navy, I'm more on the IT side of things and enterprise solutions. But we have a common background in search and rescue. And that's actually going to play a significant factor into my discussion today. So who we worked with? You can see on the left, um, there's a number of different companies, Spatial Netics, TerraDepth, helped us uh, do a lot of the visualization and data conversions, um, Hydrospatial Strategic Relations with our friend Denny Haynes, um, working with Sitco. We're going to be integrating the CID and Wibble loggers into our solution. I'll speak to that in a little bit. Starting to work with some of the management companies like the Gamma um, Maritime and also part of the working group. Sponsors that we've had for our projects, Great Lakes Observing System, and Tim gave great introduction to that project. The Canadian Hydrographic Office just recently has started using the system as well. I'll speak a little bit more about our relationship with Map the, Map the Gaps going forward. And you can see on the far right all the different initiatives that are happening around the world. We had building the Great Map the community hydrography in Canada with the indigenous communities, Crow the Bay that Sarah had mentioned earlier today, and then obviously the broader seabed 2030. So the solution we developed, um, our goal was to make it fully automated. The less human interaction, the better, right? It's a lot of data, a lot of time, and we had that main goal to make it completely automated. So I'll take you quickly through the workflow, but essentially, we have a, a data logger solution, it's called the muscle kit. You know, attaches to the bottom of your vessel like all those zebra muscles. Gathers the data, transmits the data through cellular Wi-Fi to the cloud where it's processed and to convert it into different formats. And then it's sent to various source, uh, uh, data consumers, IHO, DCB being the primary one today. It also is being sent to Gloss for their hex map that Tim mentioned, and that's the visualization aspect of this. Um, we're also sending it to Teradapt for visualization, and that starts solving some of the pain points that Katie mentioned about giving feedback back to the operators, right? Give them a, a picture's worth a thousand words. And then remotely managing the fleet, it's growing. It started off with two vessels, it's now upwards of 20 um, uh, for the GLOW side, another dozen for the CHS side. Um, and we need to be a, make it a self-service, self-managing solution. And that's kind of how it's gonna evolve. Uh, over the next couple of years. We also recognize it's not one logger. 
you know, CID and the Wibble logger are out there, these other devices on the marketplace. We're going to be taking data from all those loggers and introducing it into the pipeline so they can take advantage of the other the entire workflow that we've developed. And we also recognize there's more data consumers than just Gloss and these, um, the IHO DCDB. There's the communities, they want the data. Ship captains may want the data, or owners may want the data. Chart makers of various sorts outside of the National Hydrographic offices may want the data. So we recognize that. So we're working to figure out how to get that data in an automated way to those consumers. We also did a study for Gloss. Um, a lot of the working group was, were recognized this. People have been trying to figure out what, how the solution all compare. So we did a study in these areas, I'm not gonna go through them, and basically provided the results to Gloss earlier this year. Essentially, it evaluates all the loggers and all the complete IT solutions out there to give you some feedback as to what's best for your situation. What's good for one person is not necessarily good for another person's solution, right, or needs. So have a look at it, reach out to Tim, I'm sure he'll be happy to share, right? So a few good case studies I'm going to walk you through today. Uh, first is Gloss and Lakebed 2030, right? As Tim mentioned, it's not related to Seabed 2030, but the intent is the same, map the Great Lakes. Tim mentioned the background, the Great Lakes are not mapped um, today to the modern day standards. Our objective was to get a fully automated solution in quite quickly. And ironically, when Tim said quickly, he meant quickly, right? We basically started this in, I think, the spring of 20. 21 and we had vessels online that spring right the winter and then into the spring and we've been growing it ever since it was first deployed on a couple of search and rescue vessels that Derek and I both operate hence the the value there is that these vessels spend a lot of time at sea right three to four hundred hours a year in the Great Lakes which is about six months operating time so we started collecting data in 2022, we started adding more vessels. In 23, we added again more vessels. There's upwards of 20. You can see there, we've done 24 million data points, uh, equivalent about 7,000 hours of sea time and over 50,000 uh, nautical miles traveled, right? The data, different formats. What Tim needs for Gloss is different from what IHO needs, GeoJSONs and XYZ files. And, and, and TerraDept is also using a different format as well. Um, uh, three point cloud models. Uh, we transmitted it as under GLOSA as a trusted node. We have the ability to white label our engine to allow you to send it under any trusted node once you get the legal agreements in place. Data transfer through also to Tim and GLOSS through AWS, you know, S3 buckets for those on the technical side. And a picture's worth a thousand words, there's Tim's hex map again. There's also starting to see some impact there on the Great Lakes, on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario predominantly. And there's a close up as well. Um, you can start on Lake Erie, it's probably got the most diverse coverage there on the northern side of the, the Canada US border. And you can see Lake Ontario as well. The vessel in the, the Toronto area is the search and rescue vessel that I operate. And again, we, we've got a lot of data over the last three years. The vessel in the upper left is a vessel on Lake Michigan, Northwestern University. Uh, we went. Uh, one fall, we installed it. The following fall, we went back for this Lake Bed 2030 conference and, and shared this image with them in terms of their data collected. They had forgotten they had installed it, and all this data was collected and sent up to the IHO DCDB. The second quick uh, case study I'll talk about is, is what Sarah had mentioned in Crowd the, Pilot, Crowd the Bay pilot. Um, Sarah had asked to evaluate the loggers. In addition to the Wibble loggers, we sent her a logger for as well and basically got her online underneath the the, the trusted node of OFM. In early January this year, and they ran it, installed it on a sail vessel, uh, sailboat, um, and ran it for about three months. Um, and then subsequently, we, we got it, the data was all processed. Again, it's all in real time. The data, once captured, is either transferred out through cellular or Wi Fi, and within minutes is processed at the IHO DCDB. Okay. Um, another 150,000 uh, death records. 45 sea hours and uh, just under 200 nautical miles. The, this is a recreational vessel, a sailing vessel, right? So it was quite the, uh, I think the accomplishment. 
And here from the IHO BCDB, you can see the visualization of that data. The third one I'll mention is Canadian Hydrographic Service, the community um, hydrography uh, project they're working on. This is all about helping the indigenous communities in Canada, either in the Arctic and the Pacific coast or the Atlantic coast, start gathering data so they can use it. And CHS's mandate is essentially to help them gather data, teach them how to use it, teach them how to create maps and, and provide it for their own use. So this data is not going to the DCDB today, but it is being transferred to CHS, automated through Dropbox. Never thought we'd do that. Um, they've got 13 participating communities across the Canadian Arctic, the Pacific and Atlantic. We've the vessels, uh, loggers were installed in late summer, early fall, September, August, September. And since then they've collected a million, a million death records, 300 sea hours of travel and 1,100 nautical miles. So again, I think we're starting to build up the momentum in terms of the, uh, the amount of data that we are starting to collect and process. A few slides that CHS asked me to highlight for you. This is about helping the communities start using their data. As I mentioned earlier, it's not all just about the DCDB, it's others are starting to want access to the data. Even historical reasons, they, they're slow to start and understand how they can leverage that data. So they're starting, CHS's mandate is to help them. The image on the left, you can see where CHS is starting to deploy units. If it's the Orange Force solution or the CID solution, um, and also CHS has another logger that's internal to, to, to themselves. So you can see where this is being deployed across the country. They're also then sharing that data and helping them make maps, like I mentioned. They're also sharing it with the internal government departments. So the Coast Guard up there are starting to use their internal applications to leverage the data and use it um, for search and rescue operations up north. Some of our successes and challenges, getting the right sailing profile. We want vessels to go out and sail and you know, build up the hours. That is expensive if people are paying for, for the cost of that, right? So it's, it's a key to pick the right types of profile. Getting the vessels online quickly. We can have a logger shipped, installed within hours, um, and you're online collecting data. Monitoring the fleet remotely, as this all grows, it's gonna be essential to ensure you can manage that, right? And we've operated, I, I think Bill Gates said this years ago, was get the right data in the right format to the right person in a timely manner, right? That's, that's what we're trying to achieve in sense of all the data conversions that we're doing and the fact that it's fully automated and we're doing it in near real time. Like any of the vessels, they're old, they're new, they're different. Every install has been slightly different depending on the technology stack that's on the vessel. So it's something we have to overcome. Um, as you start getting into remote areas, your, G your GNSS signals are degrading, right? When you start getting up into the Arctic, cellular coverage is spare, sparse. So things like that we have to take into account for. Here's a sample of some of the vessels. Again, most of these are working class vessels, either science vessels um, for departments of science or ministries or state owned. Uh, a lot of orange vessels on there. Again, goes back to the search and rescue. Most of them are volunteer vessels. And that's a model that's around the world in terms of the search and rescue. Volunteers are doing a lot of that in between the government assets. If we can get solutions on those vessels, you're getting free data collection in the sense of it's the routine operations. In search and rescue speak, I do search patterns. In hydrographic speak, that's a survey line, right? We're doing the same maneuvers, except we're just gathering for different reasons. And you can see also the sailboats. They're more cost efficient to run, right? In terms of sailing versus fuel costs. We're also now working together with Map the Gaps. We're gonna be introducing this logger diagnostic solution to process the data um, and, and basically made them manage this as it scales up globally. And what we like about what Map the Gaps is going is they're trying to solve that funding challenge, looking at corporations to essentially see how they can get corporate money for citizen science. Part of that may go to crowdsource or symmetry. Part of that may go to, you know, broader surveying uh, missions. 
I've already talked about sort of the industry support that we do in terms of the working group and the solution development, but next year we're also going to be deploying it out to do Arctic sea lifts, right? Vessels leave Quebec, Quebec City and Montreal, and they sail around Quebec and Labrador up into the Arctic to bring supplies. That's very time sensitive given the, the, uh, the sailing season. And we'll continue to roll out at Gloss, more vessels, and we'll continue to support the CHS community project. And if anybody's interested, please come see me. We can talk about what your uh, challenge is. Final thoughts, are we making an impact? Um, out of 150 gigabytes of data received, we've got over 25 million soundings. Um, Jennifer mentioned a four-year project that got 50 million soundings. So it's, it's parallel to some of that. Time period of about 28 months. We only sail around six months in the year, seven months of the year in the Great Lakes. Um, it's a sad time back home. We're starting to take folks out of the water and put them on the hard for the winter. Distance traveled about 50,000 nautical miles and over 7,400 hours. What does that mean in dollars? If you're to charter a boat, it would cost you a certain amount of money. Price per ping on all the dollars have been circulated in the last few days. Upwards of $2 million. That's 1% of the 2 million, or sorry, 200 million that Tim mentioned for the gloss is looking to get, right? So we're saving them that money because of the, the crowdsource bathymetry. And that's all I have. Any questions? Do we have any questions? Uh, thank you so much, Colin. That was really interesting, especially seeing it from the search and rescue kind of um, perspective, which is something we don't always talk about here. And um, so next up, we have Anthony Clem. Anthony, following his 10 years as a commissioned officer with NOAA, he's now working as a physical scientist with NOAA's Coast Survey Development Lab at the Hydrographic Systems and Technology Branch. He's currently a graduate student at the University of Maryland Global Campus, and he's pursuing a master's in data analytics, focusing on data visualization and machine learning, I believe. Anthony is passionate about bridging the gap between emerging technologies and the everyday hydrographer. And I also learned at dinner last night that he's also published a few children's books about the natural world around us, which I'm very excited to read. Here we have Anthony. Well, thank you for that uh, great introduction. Thank you, Annie. Do I push next? Or... Okay, so I need to stall your time. Okay, um, actually, I want to start off with just with a show of hands. Um, in the context of crowdsourced bathymetry, have you ever heard anyone express, or maybe yourself, expressed any skepticism towards the usefulness of crowdsourced bathymetry huh oh come on guys raise your hands yeah yeah of course i think and that's a big barrier um, that we are working to to hopefully overcome and uh, that is my goal hopefully throughout this uh, presentation today is to provide some um some examples of and show that, hey, we should be paying attention to this. There is so much value to this data. Um, of course, uh, I work for NOAA, which is the hydrographic office um, for uh, the United States. Uh, well, one of them, actually. It's a little confusing. But um, we, uh, we really feel that this is worth our while to continue to pursue and to measure that um, how important this data is and i want to hopefully communicate that value to you today so um, as you can see i love pixar um, and um, so many of my illustrations in this presentation were actually created by my friend named dolly three it's a model uh, owned by OpenAI. Um, so I actually didn't make these, and, but, um, but I was the creator of the prompt, so maybe I can 
<laughs> Maybe I am the creator. But anyway, um, let's start off with some rhetorical questions here. How can the history of JEBCO inspire us in our current CSB efforts? And I think we, we heard time and time again already the past two days of this beautiful heritage and beautiful legacy uh, that JEBCO has provided to us. And we kind of stand on the shoulders of giants here. Um, and how can we can push that into the future, right? How can this history of JEBCO and crowdsourced with symmetry inform us of where we should be going in the future? Where are we at with the modern CSB approach? I think we heard lots of good examples. We're starting up uh, quite a few really exciting initiatives. Um, and what is the future of CSB? Why even bother with CSB in an age of high precision survey systems? Why even bother? And how good is CSB data? How does it compare with modern surveys? How can measuring that help us grow the size of our crowd? Does understanding how good our data is and the value and the impact it can have towards navigation and, and science and everything else. When we, if we tell those stories as uh, Fabian Cousteau is talking about, how is that going to help us grow the crowd that we need and want? And so there's, there you go. Are we gonna stick our head out of the sand um, when everyone else is, still has their head in the sand? How do we get to first stop in levels of performance with CSV when it feels like we're only at this level? The answer is baby steps. And please meet Lucy. She's three months old and she's my newest baby and she is amazing. <laughs> Hi, Lucy. We love you. Um, so I want to talk about CSB as part of what we we think in NOAA is it's part of the mapping solution. We've seen the, the graphics with the gaps and that we need to fill them. And, and the data that is available in the DCDB right now is actually sometimes the best available data that is, that is there for navigation or at all. Right now in the DCDB, there's more than 1 billion soundings. This is something that we should not ignore. And it's there free and available for anyone to go and discover and download. Here's a few different areas. So um, this is uh, you know, the Puget Sound, for example, and uh, Boulevard Roads and the approaches to Houston, uh, Galveston, right? These are, these are major ports. But also in areas where maybe it's not a major port. This data right now available is the best, is the only data, bathymetry we have. And you can see even that, oh, well, we did, we did our best, I guess, to uh, survey some part of the deeper part of the channel, but we stopped before, um, we stopped instead of going actually everywhere where boats need charts. So uh, this, this data holds potential value, and we want to know how good it actually is. And so that's what I ended up doing. And here's another example of, of the, that's the best nautical chart for this waterway in Alaska, right? Does that help anyone? No. <laughs> but we do have data there. Here you go also, that uh, gray hash area. Does anyone, navigators, know what that means? Cartographers, that's unsurveyed area right but we have crowdsourced bathymetry so we know that it's actually an important place to have charted data because people are navigating there and that's the best data we have available should we, should we be using it right um, in some places we have enough data where we say hey this is a comprehensive crowd we have a statistical um significant a number of soundings like in, in this two kilometer stretch in Houston, we have over 3 million soundings. That's a lot of data. So what, what I've done is uh, built a uh, 
a proof of concept processing script to be able to take the data from the DCDB, do some cleaning, what we call um, extra extract, transform, and load, uh, ETL, um, and then apply some tides. Uh, I use discrete zone tides in this uh, proof of concept study, and then uh, help um, estimate and, and then apply a, a vertical bias that I mean, probably it's mostly transducer draft um, from the vessel by comparing it against good data and then exporting that data out into a gridded format where it's actually useful. So uh, for the tide correction example, I think, uh, um, the, you know, we're using zone tides. So you have a, a time and a position of your data and, um, and also uh, a Z, um, Z value of that data. The, the zone tides will reference it back to a shore-based tide station and you'll be able to uh, correct it with the correct time offset as well as a magnitude offset uh, based on that reference station. And it also it, it uses the NOAA co-ops API to pull down all that data automatically that it needs, uh, both uh, spatially and temporally. Um, so it's all automated. You don't have to go to any website and download anything, make sure you got all the right data. Also, you know what I said, the, the data-derived transducer draft. Uh, this is a significant uh, source of error. Uh, if you don't um, take care of this part, and even vessels that you would think have a good idea of what their vent, uh, transducer draft is, uh, sometimes they just don't have a good answer, um, and sometimes they lie. So um, it's super hard to see, but even the, the Okeanos Explorer here we derived their uh, um, draft to be 5.78 meters, their transducer draft. So almost six meters uh, transducer draft. If you don't apply that to your data, then uh, your data is gonna be not super useful, right? Um, but then the NOAA, uh, NOAA ship Thomas Jefferson, which is a similar size vessel, uh, they had already applied some offset that they thought they had of their transducer, but it was actually um you know an average about 90 centimeters off so um so this step will do with this kind of data derived estimation of trans of any vertical bias and then we can apply that to the data there's better ways to do this uh, i will just give you a, a quick just primer dr uh, brian calder uh, will also put in a subtype of reputation score um, of the of each vessel and so over time you know, you can have vessels that you trust a lot more than others, and you can use that information and, and how you deal with the data. It's a really, really awesome solution. So I just want to show you a few uh, examples. One example was um, crowdsource bathymetry was collected on a hydrographic vessel while they were uh, surveying. So they, they left their, trans their navigation echo sounder on, um, and was collecting it using their navigation GPS um, while they were using their multi-beam and their, you know, multi-beam uh, GNSS, INS system. And so we have really, really good uh, data here where we can do a comparison. And so, um, you know, this is all just the crowdsource bathymetry. This is not, this is not the survey grade data from any survey grade uh, sonar. And uh, if you do the comparison, it was only a 30 average of a 30 centimeter offset with a uh, 50 centimeter standard deviation at one one sigma. That is pretty good for free data. I've seen I've seen comparisons of multi beam data to another multi multi beam uh, data set a couple years later and have similar or even worse. Uh, comparison statistics. So we should be paying attention to this. Houston uh, Galveston was able to uh, process the, those 3 million soundings there. Mean difference of 20 centimeters and a standard deviation of 60 centimeters. And uh, you can see visually where the, the two uh, data overlap, which was like a contemporary hydrographic survey and then the CSB, where they overlapped, there's, uh, very, very little difference. 
And, and really, it exceeded my expectations when I first saw the data and actually ran it again, because I was like, this can't be right. Um, we did some work in the San Juan Islands up just north of uh, Seattle, Washington. Beautiful data. But what's also is like just when we were doing this to evaluate the script, we actually found charted discrepancies that were pretty dangerous. And so we, we found some, uh, some the shoal, this Nautilus shoal, which is famous uh, in the approach to Chesapeake Bay. Uh, encroaching to the south and we obviously you can see the shoals and and Delaware Bay that have shifted from where they were uh, charted and uh, we I pulled in some Landsat uh, satellite derived bathymetry calculated real quick uh, just to corroborate and yeah there there's definitely that shoal there that is not charted so uh, we've been able to inform um, our own office about those discrepancies and we're working on it. Um, also, you can see here, CSB in essentially uncharted waters. Perhaps we should be using that to update the nautical charts. Again, here's that, um, that other waterway in the Ninglick River. And it's also valuable for reference data for calibrating CSB, uh, for SDB. If you have some satellite drive bathymetry and you, and man, I wish I had some reference data to, to really calibrate my SDB a little bit better. Well, you could probably use this too. And, um, you know, we should be probably using this in areas where we use CSB, oh no, satellite drive bathymetry to create a chart showing detected shoals, but um, we didn't have any bathymetry at the time. Now we have bathymetry, we should plug this in. So, how good is it? I would say easy process CSB quality meets CATSOXI. And a part of it is, you know, it's not full search. It's not systematic survey. It's crowdsourced bathymetry. It's not even crowdsourced hydrography. Um, but, um, you know, the, the quality, the vertical um, quality of this data and horizontal is actually pretty good. You know, we should be using it more in SCB calibrations, and we should be working towards uh, more robust uncertainty modeling. And um, that's the end of my uh, presentation. I just wanted to say thank you very much, and hopefully you can bring this back to whoever was skeptical, maybe it was yourself, and, uh, and understand that there is so much value to this data. We should not be ignoring it outright we should be paying attention to it and using it to support safe navigation thank you so much thank you thank you so much anthony that was fantastic and really interesting do we have a few questions from the floor do we have a roving mic um up the front and then to sarah please everett also 30 centimeters is incredible Thank you, Anthony. You're really addressing a topic that for too many years has been one of the bigger obstacles in this everyone contributing to, to mapping the entire CMAP. So we have a crowdsourced bathymetry working group meeting where we address this. You're part of that, I'm part of that. Um, and we, we're Sometimes we're good at talking to each other on the topic and not outside, but this is an example of even more, uh, what do you call it, stovepiping, because I think this presentation should be at a hydrographic survey working group and should actually be a presentation at HSSC, because this is really taking, you're coming with very good arguments to convince those that are skeptical in our own community and outside, but but first of all, let's start with ourselves. Uh, so we, I, we definitely need to follow up on this. And I'm challenging Director Luigi Sinapi here to, to see what is the best venue and best arena to make sure that we use this uh, and either by yourselves or someone on behalf of you do this presentation for, for the relevant public uh, outside of this community. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> if I may just because I've been mentioned, so thank you very much. Uh, we, were, we have planned uh, uh, within our uh, community 
a, um, a workshop on crowdsource bathymetry for next year under the DIRCC. I think that could be the very first uh, opportunity for, uh, for presenting <laughs> this presentation and this, uh, this view uh, from uh, you know, from 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 what you're exp experiencing uh, uh, on the field uh, uh, to the to the community, the community will be a community of uh, of the ninety. We hope <laughs> as large as possible, up to ninety eight member states a representative. So, but uh, that will be the the very next opportunity uh, if you're available for this. Uh, okay. For this, well, thank you for thank this. You. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony, that was great. Um, my question, and I apologize if I missed this, um, and it might go into that last slide you had about uncertainty modeling and such, but did you do any runs where you intentionally degraded your data because CSB doesn't require offsets or draft, right, to be submitted to the DCDB? So did you think about you know, degrading it like 10% don't have those measurements, 50% don't have those measurements and rerunning it to see how it affects kind of the, the ultimate answer that you get? Yeah, so uh, in the script and the, the test testing that I did, um, any data that I wasn't able to derive a an estimated uh, transducer draft, I did not, I threw it out. Um, it still had a lot of data. Um, and really, I could have worked harder to find other uh, hydrographic surveys where there was a choke point where vessels would go over it. Um, but it was just a kind of a time and convenience thing. But yeah, there, I mean, there's plenty of things that we can do and should consider to, uh, to communicate the quality of our data uh, to the wider users. Okay, uh, Anthony, great presentation. Really, really great material. I agree with Everett's comments um, that this should be put to a, a slightly different audience. And I think, I think you recognize that. Um, I think the flip side of that is the uh, the hydrographic offices probably already recognize the utility and the lack of response to the circular letter is not necessarily the hydrographic offices, but higher levels in government that have national security concerns. So this almost reinforces their concern. <laughs> so on one hand, you're demonstrating the great utility of crowdsource bathymetry, but you're also highlighting the great utility of crowdsource bathymetry. <laughs> so I think, you know, in that respect, and we've had discussions as uh, the crowdsource bathymetry working group, that connecting it to those governments or higher level parts of government that are um, involved with kind of their commitments to SDGs, to the UN Ocean Decade, um, that, that we need to do as much work with those communities as we do with the hydrographic offices. So again, I think this information would be really useful to share to those, uh, those, those groups and those communities. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Anthony. That was really great. So next up, we have Shaw Solomon. With the computer science background, Shaul is the lead data scientist at DocTech, an Israeli maritime startup rev revolutioning the digitizing for the of the world's waterways. Additionally, he's also a teacher and lecturer at Y Data School of Data Science, teaching the Intro to Data Science course. A man of many talents, he's also worked as a hand model in the past and has volunteered to use these skills for JEBCO should the need arise. I present Shaul Solomon. Hello. <laughs> All right, good. Um, I'm happy today to present DocTech as the lead data scientist. And today we're gonna to be talking about symbiotic interoperability. And hopefully by the end of today, we can not only pronounce it, but also understand it. So we're gonna discuss a little bit about who are we DocTech, not going too deeply into our background, but a little bit of the reference and why we're going to get to symbiotic interoperability and how it's relevant, not only to DocTech, but to the larger audience. 
So DocTech's larger vision is to create a digital infrastructure, digital twin of ports and waterways. And currently we are most predominantly focused within uh, ports. And our main idea is to do a form of crowdsource bathymetry applied, where we correct our own data loggers attaching onto tugboats and service vessels within the ports. As you can see, uh, normal uh, vessels have a host of various sensors. And we do that to try and map the conditions of the ports, both environmental and topological. And for the sake of today, and in general, our main focus is bathymetry. Uh, overall, our main product that we create for ports is something called Aquascope AI. And what we do is, first of all, we can see that we can have increased visibility of what's going on. You know, oftentimes most ports, as you know, do surveys once every three, six months, depending on the needs. We can provide a real-time visualization of the depths at the time. We're able to understand predictability of where the sediment has been moved. And if you want to understand there was some storm that happened in the area or some massive event, you're able to understand where is the massive erosion and deposition happening within the ports. And also efficiency for dredging optimization, where are they shallower than the declared depths, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the thing is that even though this is a fantastic idea, the catch is that while we know that there is the entire ecosystem of possible types of data formats and data usages, which is part of the idea of interoperability, that there's a lot of different data sources going around. There's data everywhere, but we kind of realize that we're kind of stuck. Data's floating around and we don't know how to capture it. The largest issue that we had at DocTech was trying to incentivize uh, vessels to, to join us, to be a data partners, because we work mostly from the hardware and the software. As an AI company, we don't have our own vessels. So predominantly, we tried to do initially, we tried to even provide some form of financial incentive. But even then, it wouldn't be, not always would they uh, join along, or if they did, they would just say, okay, stick it on, and not you know, calibrate or configure their own echo sounders. So we introduced, in parallel to Aquascope, our own product called VAX, Vessel Activity Explorer. And the basic idea is, is that we decided that the best thing that they would want for the vessels, for the tugboats, is to provide information for themselves about their own onboard sensors. So we created VAX predominantly as a management tool for the fleet managers and the mariners uh, using the sensors on board. Currently, the main thing that we have at VAX is we're able to create a real-time alert of whenever the dog boats are going in shallow waters or in restricted areas. And we found that this is going to help us incentivize that the vessels themselves are going to want to put our uh, D1099s, our data loggers, onto the vessels for their own sake. And on top of this, we know that whenever we discuss using onboard sensors, there's actually a host of various features that we can do from fuel optimization, carbon emission monitoring, predictive maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, that would work. The issue is, yeah, normally we see the data like this, but for hydrographers in the room who we'll visualize like this, we see the data is oftentimes extremely noisy, specifically in ports when you have, you know, high silting rates, you have, yeah, data can be extremely, extremely noisy. Um, so even though theoretically there's data everywhere, there is noise everywhere. And so even if we try to incorporate our own form of noise filtering using machine learning and signal processing in AI, we still see that there are certain places in the port where it isn't very clear at all whether or not just from looking at the data itself, is this itself just a form of noise or some, are we capturing something about the, the port itself? Shame. <laughs> We got that. It's a big shame. We don't know how to deal with that. And so we found, we tried to find a solution through the form of symbiotic interoperability. Um, so if we think about being inspired from the marine life, the, the clownfish and the sea anemone live uh, in a form of mutualistic symbiosis, where the anemone both protects and feeds the clownfish, and in turn, the clownfish feeds and protects the anemone, the, the sea anemone a true win-win that everyone benefits from each other. So our vision of symbiotic interpretability is we take the idea of interpretability that is present within the larger world of, you know, uh, the accessibility of all data that's accessible in ports, like the S100, and we're trying to push the idea that not only do we need to have interpretability, but the data can be symbiotic. The different data sources that we have can help each other enrich uh, and evaluate each one to the other. So if you look at DocTech, as a fundamental idea, we had the idea of using VAX 
in order to collect more sensor data from the vessels, and in turn, we can provide back to VAX a form of shallow water detection. We then take that data and we provide it using, you know, a form of uh, our own pipeline of processing and enriching the data into the Aquascope AI. And symbiotic interpretability allows us that now we can take the daily, daily bathymetric data that we've processed through a month's worth of data from the vessels to then do a smarter shallow water detection based off real-time maps, which then allows cleaner sensor data and, in a sense, keeps the entire cycle, every, each of the two sides between Aquascope and VAX, helping and supporting one another. Um, even though this is the main idea that we use to represent, we see that we can do this through a host of different use cases. I'm just going to discuss three right now. One of them is a project we've been working at at DocTech, is using idle tugboats as tidal stations. While in the States you have NOAA's, you know, a lot of APIs that can access tides. Uh, at DocTech we work internationally and getting tide stations is oftentimes an extremely laborious and inaccessible task. And what we've realized is that when the vessels are kind of berthed, which is 80% of the time, what they're currently, what they're mapping is in a way uh, seawater levels. And so what we can do is take the data, clean it, process it, interpolate it, create a form of tidal data um, for the other vessels and in a way allow us to get a better bathymetric data that allows us then again to get better tugboat data. Another example which was discussed before by Anthony about draft, there's the classic idea of the static offsets that is an issue, but as we know there's often the times of dynamic draft uh, that is constantly changing across the ports and this affects both underkill clearance or dynamic underkill clearance and also impacts offset integration. So while we have issues that are existing across a host of different sectors of problems, we realized that by creating an ecosystem where the Aquascope and the VAX and different data sources can help enrich each other and, and provide uh, an updated dynamic draft. And we can also do a form of predictive maintenance, where oftentimes we see that, you know, we have vessels that have echo sounders or GNSS sensors on board, and they're extremely faulty and not calibrated which creates for themselves on board a lot of issues. And then when we get the data itself, we get a lot of uh, issues and a lot of you know, long nights trying to process and clean it. And what we can understand is that if we can ensure that we can do predictive maintenance of when the sensors are good or not good, we can help the vessels themselves by minimizing dry dock time, ensuring that they're being active as much as possible, and then ensure that the data that they are collecting will be as good as possible. Uh, when we think about the future ahead, there are actually many different types of things that you can use in, in the form of symbiotic interoperability and hopefully this talk is just a form of a, an inspiration thought leadership as we were trying to push to for all the possible use cases that could exist out there when we think about the integration of various data sources and in many ways the future is here we're happy to announce officially that DocTech is now the newest uh, trusted node and we're really giving data also to the IHO to the DCDB and helping not only see ourselves as seeing ourselves as part of the ecosystem and contributing to the larger ecosystem. That's it. Finn, thank you. Uh, questions? I'll just do the hand, the hand can talk. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Really interesting. Um, are there any ports on your list that you've identified that uh, you'd be sure that would have, an, like a port of Rotterdam needs to resurvey every two months, uh, but, and spends a lot of money on, uh, on, on doing that. Um, but there could be other ports that have resurvey necessity, but not necessarily all the means to do the, the resurvey. And this is a warning system for them. Uh, have you started identifying ports and start to liaise with them? Uh, yes. Uh, fundamentally, one of the products, as you saw, is in order to be able to do dredging um, allocation to understand. Oftentimes, when we think about a port, it's not necessarily a binary, do we need to dredge or not need to dredge? Because the moment that you do dredging already, now the silting uh, happens again. But we have been able to identify, and this is one of the products that we provide predominantly to ports, is er both areas in the port which are having uh, high deposition rates, um, where, where they need to dredge, and also being able to estimate how much they need to dredge. 
And we've seen that really uh, oftentimes we've brought information that the ports had a certain idea that maybe in this certain area of the port we need to dredge. And then, you know, looking at, at, um, at our uh, aquascope, I've understood that it's a much larger area. So going also back to what Anthony said, the usages of applied CSP is not just navigation, not navigation, but can provide fundamental insights regardless of accuracy is 10 centimeters or 30. Do we have any more questions? Not about the hand modeling. <laughs> They're for later. That's for later, yes. Perfect. No, okay. Thank you so much, Thank you. That was fantastic. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Brian Caldier. So following his PhD in electrical and electronic engineering in Scotland, Brian joined the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping slash the Joint Hydrographic Center at the University of New Hampshire where he's now a research professor and the associate director of the Center of Coastal and Ocean Mapping, or SICOM. His research interests principally are centered around robust rapid signal processing methods applied to ocean mapping data. And he's probably most known for his work in developing the CUBE algorithm, saving a lot of us data processors from carpal tunnel, which we thank him most gratefully for. Thank you. Um, he's also an active member of the Crowdsource Bathymetry Working Group and he's currently investigating inexpensive methods for data loggers for swarm deployment in undermapped areas of the world. The highlight of Brian's career remains teaching me digital signal processing in October of 2017. However, here's Brian. So I, I'm also congratulately obligated to say that Eileen was the best student in the class. So of course, I'm, I'm also congratulated, con contractually obligated to say that about all the students in the class. And, We'll get this, is on video. this is on video. Okay, fair enough. Um, good afternoon, everybody. What I'm going to talk about today is the project we've been working on in inexpensive or as, le as low expense as we can systems for collecting volunteer data. Um, the project that we've been working on, there we go, is, is this fellow here you can see. Um, we call it the wireless inexpensive bathymetry logger or uh, Wibble. Uh, Sarah reliably informs me that you can't say that without smiling, which makes me very happy. I'm not going to talk to you about the technical details of the project, however, although I'm, I'm happy to do so at some later date. Anybody who's talked to me about it before will tell you that you may glaze over and go to sleep before we're done. But what I'm going to focus on today is the design decisions that we made in putting the system together in the first place, because those design decisions uh, reflect our thought processes and what we think are important if we're going to have a system like this that scales effectively. And by scales, I don't mean a few tens of loggers or even a few thousands of loggers. I mean tens of thousands of loggers because there are lots of ships out there and we need to hit as many as we possibly can. So I've, I've structured this around the big design decisions that we have to make. And the, the first one really was about making a system and a system that anyone can use. And when I mean that anyone can use, what I, I, I mean is I want to be able to give it to you so you can collect your own data. I work at a research center. We're paid to do research. We're not really paid to do operational work. And so if I wanted to run this entire system, that would be extremely problematic. I have to give you the ability to do it. So what I have to do is to build a system that you can then clone and use for yourself. So in terms of a system, this is what I have in mind. This seems obvious, right? It's not enough just to make a logger. You also need to make the software that goes along with that logger and the thing that makes the data products too. Believe it or not, before we started doing this, many of the loggers that were available came with just the hardware. And they had absolutely nothing to do with the data afterwards. And if you wanted to do anything with your data, you just had to suck it up and do it yourself. That's not an effective way. That's not a system we can scale. It's not a system we can give to people who have, have them run if they're not experts in doing this. And we have to be realistic and understand that the majority of people who are going to do this are not going to be experts. So there are a number of complications involved in that, implications from that, that basic statement there. One of the obvious ones is that not every collection is going to be the same. My belief is that the majority of the places where these things will be deployed are places where cost is a very sensitive factor. By which I mean, if we are deploying in an area where there's not a lot of money going around, we need to make it 
as cheap as possible to implement as well as cheap to deploy and to run over the length of the time of the, the project. So my model of how this will mostly work is the idea that we will fit loggers to ships or the local community will fit loggers to their own ships. And then instead of having to have some internet connected system that you know, puts the data into a data center for you, instead what you do is somebody rocks up with their mobile device handily held in their pocket, pulls the data off the logger and then gets to somewhere where there is an internet connection and then batch uploads all of the data. And so we designed the logger to run on Wi-Fi. And that allows us to do that. The, the, ser the logger runs its own web server. So anything with a browser, any phone, any tablet can come up to pick the data off. But we recognize that there will be some implications, some use cases where people will have an always on connected system. But by designing something with Wi-Fi in it, it means that we can also join somebody else's network instead. So we, we can allow it to adapt. But the key component here is the only difference between those two solutions you can see on screen here is the software that we run on the logger. We have intentionally made the hardware as simple as we can possibly make it. Most of the smarts is in the software, and that's even field upgradable. So if you're out in the field and you want to switch, all you can do, you can just reprogram the logger in the field with an application. You don't even have to know how to do it yourself. This might look scary. Don't freak out. This is the data model for how the system processes its data. Read it left to right. Data comes in on the left-hand side. Magic happens in the middle, pops out of the right-hand side into DCDB. The bit at the top is monitoring and metadata. The reason I'm showing this is because the implication of giving what we're doing to somebody to run their own data collection is that they own their own data. And so when we heard yesterday about the idea that we take a collection platform and we donate it to a local community so that they are collecting their own data, this re represents the same idea. And that means that the data that you're collecting, you own, you have control of it, it exists in your own environment, you can download it, you can do whatever you like to it, that's where it's the bit where it's highlighted there, in a compatible format that the archive will accept, we'll get back to that in a second. The piece that uploads to the archive is the second highlight there. The system is designed to be modular and loosely coupled. And what that means is that if I turn off that piece, the rest of the system keeps on working. So you can choose whether you want to upload data or not. You don't have to upload the data. So we don't have an environment where you are forced to give your data to somebody else for them to work with it and then get your data back. If we can make this automated, then we can give the entire thing to somebody else and they can run their own environment. And that's important for a couple of different reasons, including scalability, which I'll come back to at the end, but also in terms of data rights, which is a very sensitive topic in many communities, in particularly First Nation and Indigenous communities all around the world. So we are actively intentionally supporting that. You own your data, you get to decide what you want to do with it later. We also recognize that not everybody's going to want to build their own data loggers. I think everybody should, because then you understand it, but it's not going to happen. And they may not want to run their own software either. So you've seen this guy before. If you haven't seen one physically, that's what they look like. You know, just about fits in the size of your hand. If you want to come up and uh, manipulate it yourself later, that's fine. We'll have Schultz hold it, do the hand model piece. Um, the important point here, though, is that this is developed by one of our industrial partners as a collaboration with the, the center. We're happy to do that with anybody who wants to do a collaboration. This allows people to buy their data logger rather than make their own and in possibly even rent their implementation of the data processing system, essentially giving you data collection as a service, just like you now buy software as a service when you use Microsoft's online systems, for example. And that allows people, even if they don't have any IT experience, to be able to do this themselves, but still own their own data. It's still an independent component. The second piece is about scalability and about cost. If we want a system that scales beyond tens of loggers to thousands of loggers or tens of thousands of loggers, it has to be as low cost as possible. A thousand dollar logger, you can scale to a few tens, a few hundreds, maybe you're not going to get to tens of thousands. It's just too expensive. And so by design, I think if we're going to be successful, we need to make the system as inexpensive as possible. This is the hardware that goes in the open source version, in the Bible version. 
It's intentionally designed to be as simple to make as possible. It's only a two-layer board. It only has components on one side. They're as much as possible their surface mount, which means that you can have them made in an automated fashion in any fabrication facility anywhere in the world. We've intentionally chosen common components so that the costs stay low. Because if you have, if you get a component that's used in the millions by the cell phone industry or the automotive industry or so on, the overall cost comes down dramatically, and we benefit from that as well. In volume. That board, as you see it on screen there, you can make for about $10 a board. All in. Now, you add an SD card and connectors, which, believe it or not, this connector here is the most expensive component of the entire system. Not the, not the computer, that physical component right there. Um, put it in a box, you're going to maybe treble the price. If you make it outside of the very inexpensive fabrication facilities in China, you want to make it domestically for various reasons, you probably at least double, probably quadruple the price again. That's the price you have to pay if you want to make it domestically. But in any case, still significantly cheaper than other alternatives that are there, which means that we can get to scale in this system. Similarly with the software, you know, the software there's nothing to really look at. What you're looking at is the source code for the system, source code repository and its documentation. All of the software and the hardware designs, well, not for this one, that's the commercial version, but for the open source version, are all open source. It's all freely available, and I'll put up a QR link at the end where you can go get it yourself if you want to play with it. So the software is free, but it's also designed so that the running costs are as low as possible. So it's, most of the processing is done in the cloud, so you don't have to have your own servers to do this. And it's set up to use as, as e cost efficient method of processing as we can possibly make it so that over time, it doesn't cost you more to run than it costs you to put out in the first place, because then that is the running cost that's going to triple you in the end. Third component is that we want to give you everything you need to be a DCDB trusted node. Now, for the archive, that's probably terrifying, because what that means is that everybody is going to want to send their data, and oh my God, we have to negotiate a trusted node agreement with everybody, we have to work out data format, and oh my... We don't want to do that, it'll just kill us. We've intentionally designed the system to make sure that everything that you need to be an accepted trusted mode is there. And we've already done the hard work of negotiating what the format should look like and making sure that the data is validated properly and doing the upload in the correct manner so that it slides smoothly into the archive. And so that if somebody comes along to the archive as we want to be a trusted node, and we're going to use this particular software, the archive can say, oh yeah, we've always done that before, that's easy, no problem. Here's your token, go ahead, have fun. And that makes things much simpler. That includes things like, for example, making sure the data is in the right format. The component on the left there is what the uh, B12 document says should be in the metadata, but it doesn't say what the metadata should look like. The right-hand version is an encoding of that. That's in the GeoJSON format that goes to the archive. We provide all the software to generate that automatically, to add the metadata to it appropriately, and also critically to validate it to make sure that it is correct before you send it to the archive. So the archive can be assured that when they get it, they're not going to have to pick it apart and work out what you did wrong. That's, a, that's critical if we're going to get a whole bunch of people and get to scale in this. Again, don't freak out. We recognize that people want to customize their own version, and so the system is designed so that that is possible. If you look at, if you looked carefully, there are connectors between each component of the processing here. Those connectors are designed in such a way that anybody who wants to listen can listen, so that, for example, if you want to change what happens, if you're working in a country, for example, where the, the hydrographic office says, you can collect your data, but we need a copy. Once the data is validated, which is where the red circle is, you could very easily tag on a T there and send that data directly to the hydrographic office. And then send them an acknowledgement by email to say, hey, there's new data you need to look at, here's where to find it as well. The system is designed with that in mind as well. And finally, we recognize that not everybody who's running the system is going to be an IT specialist. You can interact with the system through the Amazon interfaces, but I'm okay with doing that, but not everybody is. So we have a dashboard that we're developing. This will sit at the user level, it'll run in your browser. 
It will then give you not only a, a, an immediate dashboard of how well you're doing, how many fails you have in management, how well you're doing on your conversion rate, even things like on the bottom right there, how many of your contributors haven't sent you any data in a month? Maybe it's broken. Maybe I should look at that. Highlight those things for you automatically. Um, they will also give you control interfaces. I have a group of four computer science undergraduate students working on this as their final year project, so they're motivated to get it right. We'll get the, hopefully we'll get that within the next six months. Final component to talk about is about scaling. I've, I've emphasized a number of times that our goal here is to try and to get to scale as much as we possibly can. I'm not convinced you can do that with a single organization. Eventually that organization will become a bottleneck. Think about it like this. Here's where the data needs to end up, at the archive in Boulder. If you're a single organization collecting all this data and you want to scale to tens of thousands of collectors, everybody needs to send their data to you. Eventually, you're going to need to scale and scale and scale. You will have to buy servers, you will have to provision more compute resources, you will have to have cloud technicians, cloud data engineers, DevOps specialists, and so on. Now, if you're a company and you already have infrastructure to do that, if you are Garmin, say, that's okay, that's your job. But for the majority of us, the data collection is not the thing. The data is the thing. The data collection is the thing that gets us to the thing. If we do this, data collection is a loss leader for us. The data is the value. So you're asking yourself to build an entire infrastructure to deal with something that will generate zero revenue ever and has never proven to do that for anybody who's done this in the past. So why do that? The way we have the system structured, because we are seeding multiple cloned versions of this locally, collecting the data from just their collectors, Everybody pays a little, but nobody pays a lot. And you federate the results at the end, and everything ends up back in the archive, because every copy of the system has the same deployment and the same pipeline and the same guarantee that the data is going to come back in the right format, slide smoothly into the archive as well. This, I think, will scale. And it's a lot easier to manage as well. I'm going to leave this up just now. If you want to take some snapshots of those QR codes, those QR codes will point you in the right direction, take you right to the documentation, take you to all the source code. Like I said, it's open source. Have at it. This project is an open source project. As a research center, we are funded to look in parts of it, but we are very interested in working with partners. It is organized and controlled in the traditional open source fashion using a Git repository uh, for Historical reasons, we have half of it in GitHub and half of it in, in Bitbucket. Don't worry about that, they're more or less the same, the interfaces are good. If you are interested in doing this, by all means, clone the repository, make your changes, send us a pull request. We'd be very happy to take, as long as it doesn't break anything, we would be very happy to take your contributions. And even if it does break thing, my, my, my colleague, other Brian, or Brian Miles here, um, will happily deal with fixing things because that's one of the things he loves to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, do we have any questions? Perfect. Uh, John? John? Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, great presentation, actually, all of them. The Today have been very good. You're the first one to talk a little bit more about the scaling issue here. Um, uh, several of the previous presentations were dealing with, you know, basically two digit numbers of vessels. So from a scaling perspective, let's say that if the US has 12 million small boats, was that your number? So globally, there's something above 100 million potential vessels out there. And these would be registered, not very small boats. What if would, would any of these systems be able to be capable of handling tens of millions of, of vessels and, and data collected in this way? So I, 
I have to admit to bias, John, because it's the way I'm thinking about the problem, but I'll, I'll give you my honest opinion. I don't think a single collector system will scale beyond a few tens of thousands at most, unless you're willing to build an infrastructure and support the infrastructure and eat the cost as a loss leader for something else you're going to do with your data. As a business case, I have yet to see a convincing business case made for doing that in a commercial manner. And a volunteer organization isn't going to do it, I don't think, at least. If somebody wanted to sponsor it, I'm sure you could set one up. If you're going to get to real scale, the sort of scale you're talking about, I think the only way to do it is in a federated way, as I just described, where you empower people to collect their own data and to own their own data and to own their own process. But so that it doesn't become chaotic, you do it in a manner so that the pathway to the archive is guaranteed as long as you want to. You can always turn that bit off, but if you want to, it always gets formatted in the right way. It always is guaranteed to be acceptable to the archive so that it doesn't cause any problems when it arrives at the archive. Otherwise, Jen's going to kill me. Jen, Jen, if you can't see, Jen is nodding. <laughs> so, and she knows where I live. So, um, if you really want to get the skill, I think the only way to do it is to not try and do it as one organization, but to give the ability to do it to multiple organizations and let them own it themselves. If you do that, then there's no reason why it can't scale. Because if you can do it one place with a thousand observers, you can do it a million places with a thousand observers. And everybody pays a little bit, but nobody pays the lot. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, so that's the end of our uh, session. So thank you so much to Colin, Anthony, Shaw, and Brian. We're going to have a little break for your coffee now. And if we could meet back here at 15.05. So five past three, please. Enjoy your break. <laughs>